let's move into multiple regression. And essentially, we did simple regression last week where we just put in one dependent variable, one independent variable. We're going to do the same thing, except we're going to use multiple independent variables to determine the variance in the dependent variable. So it just bumps the complexity up just a little bit here. Okay, first of all, let's review a few things. Regression techniques can be applied to a data set in which independent variables are correlated with one another and with the dependent variable to varying degrees. But we can get into trouble if there's high correlation there, and we'll talk about that when we talk about practical issues related to multiple regression and cleaning up our data. Because the regression techniques can be used with independent variables that are correlated, okay, they're helpful for experimental research when we're actually doing very controlled research in laboratory settings. And correlation among the independent variables may be impacted by unequal numbers of, datas, of data when we run our, our analysis. So the unequal number of cases in cells or in our behavioral sciences, oftentimes in observational or survey research, when there's some manipulation of variables just because that's the way it is in the real world. So multiple regression has some robustness to to the correlation of the variables and not have it totally influence the outcome. The flexibility of regression techniques is real useful to us um, when we're looking at real world stuff. Um, and again, because we can take very complicated problems and we can look at how different independent variables are going to impact one dependent variable. So multiple regression, it's an extension of bivariate regression, which is what we did with the simple linear regression where we looked at height and weight. Um, in which several independent variables, not just one, are combined to predict that value of the dependent variable. So we'll be using the, the regression equation, but just adding additional independent variables into it when we get into this level of complexity. So it's a generalization that represents the best prediction of the dependent variable based on several continuous or dichotomous independent variables. The example that I'm going to be using throughout this presentation is going to be the height, weight, and gender. However, I changed some of the values in the original practice exercise I sent out to you because I wanted to have different outcomes. So I'm still using the same variables with the same 16 subjects, but I did change some of the values in there for the height and the weight. So just know if you run the practice exercise, the first one I sent out, you won't get the same findings you do here, but I'm going to send out the one I run here so you can also run it and see how that works. So essentially we're gonna be using the same regression equation that we did before, which is the Y1, the Y prime, which equals the A, the B1, the X1, the B2, the X2. The BK and the XK just is the infinite number of independent variables that we could potentially put into our regression equation, okay? So the same intercept and coefficients are used to predict the values and the dependent variable for all cases in the sample. So it's just an extension of the regression equation that we used last week. The goals of regression, again, is to arrive a set of the B values, which is the regression coefficients for independent variables that bring the Y values, which again is the dependent variable, as close as possible for the measurement. So regression techniques, um, there's actually different regression techniques that we can use. There's the standable, standard multiple regression, which is what this presentation is going to go over. There's also sequential or hierarchical regression, and there's statistical and stepwise regression. You choose one of these techniques that are gonna base, be based basically upon your theoretical and practical issues um, as to which one is going to be the best option for you. 
each technique, like multiple regression, the standard multiple regression, all the variables are entered at the same time. Whereas if it's sequential or stepwise variables, independent variables are entered in specific order or removed in specific order to determine the variance in there. So there's additional steps in those two, but we're gonna start with just multiple regression. Just a brief overview of those three different types of regression. Again, standard multiple regression, which is what we're going to be doing in this presentation in this week, is where all the independent variables are entered simultaneously. And then it tells us how much unique variance in the dependent variable is explained by each of those independent variables. If it's, we choose sequential hierarchical regression, um, we have a little bit more control over the regression process and we enter the independent variables based on theory, logic, practicality, um, and so then we have an idea as to which predictors may impact the dependent variable the most. Statistical or stepwise regression, again, is just another iterative of the regression techniques, um, and essentially it involves adding or removing potential explanatory variables. So it's a little bit more complicated. Each one follows basically the same outputs. There's the same cleaning of data. It's just the difference is, is how the independent variables are entered. And again, this is going to go back to the researcher's decision about how to best analyze the data. Okay, first of all, multiple linear regression is going to assume that all variables are interval or ratio level scaled. However, you can use dichotomous variables as independent variables, meaning you can have two categories. And so in our example, we're going to use gender as acceptable for an independent variable. But all the variables should really be interval or ratio level unless you use that dichotomous variable, independent variable. The dependent variables should be normally distributed around the prediction line. You're going to run scatter plots to determine this. All the variables should actually be normally distributed. Um, this is, these are assumptions. So if any of these assumptions are violated, then your regression analysis may not be accurate. That's why you clean your data up because the theory and the formula used to run regression analysis assumes that these are met. If they're not met, then you get some skewness in your data and your results are not accurate. Um, to run the data, there has to be at least three variables for multiple regression and each subject must provide data for all three variables. So when you go back to cleaning up your data and we talk about missing data, if you have 400 participants and five of them did not complete or you do not have data on all the variables you're going to enter into multiple regression analysis, those five participants have to come out. You can't use them. So all, all variables, at least three variables, and participants have to have provided data on all the variables you're going to be entering. Otherwise, you're going to have to remove those participants. To actually calculate the multiple regression, you're going to do the same thing you did for simple linear regression. You're going to do the analyze, the regression, the linear, and then the, this box is going to come up here. The only difference you're going to do is you're going to put in the dependent variable. Um, in the example, we're going to be using our dependent variable is going to be weight. And then we're going to enter two independent variables. We're going to enter gender and we're going to enter height. So if you're running multiple linear regression, you're using the same process in SPSS that you did for simple linear regression. You're just going to add additional independent variables. We're also interested in the same output that we would be interested in when it was linear regression with just the two variables, the model summary, the ANOVA table, and the coefficients. We're going to be reading these very similar to what we did with the others but it's just going to be bumped up a little bit more for complication because we have two independent variables instead of just one explaining the variance in our dependent variable, which is going to be weight. 
So this is the actual table I got from the height, weight, gender data that I ran for this presentation. And you can see that I have the model summary, I have the ANOVA, I have the coefficients. This is what comes out. What I'm interested in here is in my model summary is the R square, which is the coefficient of determination, okay, that tells us the proportion of variance in the dependent variable, which is weight, how much weight is going to vary, and how that much of that can be explained by the variation in the two independent variables, height and gender. Okay, so right here it says 0.993. That's actually going to be 99.3% of the variation in weight in our sample is going to be explained by differences in height and gender. And basically, taller individuals will weigh more and males will weigh more. That is because when we look down here and we look at our, our um, coefficients, we can actually see and I'm gonna break this down for you in the next slides, but we know that 99.3% of the changes in weight, the variance in weight in our sample is explained by gender and height. The adjusted R-square actually takes into account whenever you have all the variables in there. So you're gonna see that it's very similar to what this is because we only have the, the two independent variables If we go back and, and just run the simple linear regression where we have weight based on height, and again, this is not with the data, your practice data, this is with the data I'm using for this one. But right here, we can actually see that 65% of the variance is explained in the, in what, 65% of weight variance is explained by height in, if we just enter that one independent variable. 60, 64% here, and this is just one variable. When we run the multiple linear regression and add the independent variable of gender to the mix, then it accounts for 93% of the variance. This is the actual reason for doing multiple regression. We want to explain as much variance in our dependent variable based on independent variables. That's our goal. How much of the changes in our dependent variable can we associate with those independent variables? It helps us explain more changes. So if we use this for a practical application in counseling, we wanted to explain changes in depression levels of clients that of suicidal clients that we have in an inpatient facility. If we were actually to measure them on medication compliance, we'll say medication compliance, if we were able to um, use life satisfaction, if we were able to use, um, maybe we could look at socioeconomic status as an independent variable. Whatever the, our theories tell us impacts levels of depression and suicidal ideations, the more of those independent variables that we can show affect levels of depression, then the more focus we have on how we can alleviate levels of depression and alleviate suicidal ideations by manipulating the independent variables. That's the practical application of multiple regression to a practice type setting. We wanna know what factors are impacting the depression and the suicidal ideations in our clients because then we can help manipulate those factors to improve levels of depression and reduce suicidal ideations. The more of those independent variables that we have that we know contribute to the depression and suicidal ideations, the better treatment plans we're actually going to be able to develop. Now, the caveat here is you want to be real careful because if we know, if, we, if there's 10 things that we know impact depression and we collect data on those 10 independent variables, we put all 10 independent variables into our model, then bam, we know we've got 100% explanation for the variance in depression. So we want to be careful. We want to actually be parsimonious 
in terms of the independent variables that we know are going to impact it the most. But that's the goal of multiple regression from a practical standpoint. How much of the independent variables are going to explain changes in the dependent variables? And then how does that inform us for moving forward? So here you can see in simple linear regression with just one independent variable regressed onto the weight, height regressed onto the weight, it only explains 65% of the changes in weight in our sample, the height does. But if we go back and we actually look at our multiple regression, and in our sample we entered gender and we entered height, and regress that onto weight, and then now all of a sudden we're explaining 99% of the change in, high, in weight based on gender and height. So we have much more explanation in our sample as to the independent variables that are going to impact how much one of our participant weighs. It's going to be their height and their gender. Wouldn't that be great when we don't have to worry about what we eat or how much we exercise or the amount of sugar we take in? If it was just based on just our height and weight, wouldn't that be a simple, I mean, just on our height and gender, wouldn't that be a simple world that we wouldn't have to worry about? So also too, go back to the process of the very beginning of how we actually formulate our concepts. And while we're using this data as an example, we know theoretically, that we can't explain 99% of changes in weight just based on height and gender. So this is not a real good practical real world example. It's one to show how to read and how to do the multiple regression, but you have to think about how those variables are related and how they're going to be entered into the multiple regression. I mean, obviously, if we were doing this in a real world setting, we would also want to enter, you know, intake, calories, activity, all the other things we know that impact weight and determine which of those impact weight the most so that we can then come up with a plan to help individuals maintain a healthy weight. Just as with the linear regression, we're also interested in the ANOVA table. The ANOVA table gives us our significance. We show here that we have a 0 .000 level of significance, so we do have a significant um, regression model or regression equation here um, because it's below the 0 0.05. So we're good right there in the ANOVA table. ANOVA table gives us our, our degrees of freedom, which is 2, and our F, which is 981.202, which ultimately we have to put into our findings just like we did before in the linear regression. <clears throat> Just a review again of the regression equation, and the regression equation that we use now just includes multiple independent variables as, as we plug those in. <clears throat> so let's see what we can do when we can plug those in. So right here we're going to do our prediction equation using the coefficients. We have weight, <clears throat> which is 47138 which you look down there at the bottom at your coefficients. I have the red arrow down there. So we have the constant, which is the weight, 47.138, minus 39.133, which is sex or gender. I labeled it gender here. Plus the 2.101, which is height. Where, And this is where, because we've, we've coded the gender, we've coded male as one and female as two. And those numbers, because we categorized them one and two, they actually become meaningful in this equation. But this is our basic equation. We have weight minus gender plus height. So the average difference in weight for participants who differ by one inch in height is 2.101 pounds. So we look at the 2.101 pounds right there for every inch of height there's going to be or for every standard deviation there's going to be 2.101 pounds males tend to weigh 
39.133 pounds more than females. The reason we say this is because we coded males as one, females as two. So males have a value of gender that is one less than females. Therefore, their predicted weight will be minus one times minus the 39.133 for the gender and that equals a positive 39.133 pounds. So what that tells us based on gender is males tend to weigh 39.133 pounds more than females in our equation. So we can determine that a female who is 60 inches tall should weigh 47.138 pounds which is the constant down here under the B at the very bottom of the coefficients, minus the 39.133 times 2, because females were 2, plus 2101, okay, times, that should be 60, not 6. That's the, t the height. So we get 94.932 pounds. So we can predict a female who is 60 inches tall should weigh 94.932 pounds in our sample. Okay? Now, if you actually go up to the standard error of the estimate under the model summary, remember this is our um, prediction level or our confidence level. It's that standard error under the bell curve, okay? So standard error of the estimate, which is 2.295, right? That means that 68% of females fall within one, or 68% of all participants fall, no. That means that 68% of females who are 60 inches tall will weigh between 90.341 pounds. Okay, let's go back up here to the standard error of the estimate. It's 2.295. The standard error of the estimate in the model summary means that 68% of participants are going to fall within 2.295 standard deviations. Okay, if we double that, then we're going to get the 95%. So what we can say is what we did with the simple linear regression. So given the earlier discussions of that, we can say 95% of females who are 60 inches tall will weigh between 90.341 pounds, which is up there, the 94.932 minus 4591, which is the 2.29 times 2 to get the 90. 5% and 99.523 pounds, which is the 94.932 plus the 4.501 pounds. So that's our error. That's We can say with confidence based on our numbers here that 95% of females who are 60 inches tall will weigh between 90 pounds and 99 pounds based on our multiple regression here. So we're going to talk about some practical issues that you have to delve into when you're doing multiple regression. And again, this is going to go back up to model assumptions and it's going to go back up to the things that we have to do to clean our data. We either have to clean our data, we have to explain our data. So first of all, we have to understand that multiple regression like correlation, like bivariate regression, it looks at relationships among variables, but it does not necessarily indicate causality. If we want to demonstrate causality, if we want to demonstrate that height and gender cause our weight, then that's logical and experimental. That has to do with how we set up our study, how we 
get our sample population, how we assign the sample population, that's in the methodology part. That is not in the statistical part. So while we're saying with our multiple regression, we're explaining this level of variance, we cannot make causal statements just based on our statistics, okay? The theory informs the inclusion of variables rather than statistics. And what that means is, again, we have to have theory, we have to have observation, we have to have other empirical support to actually determine which independent variables we need to include to improve our prediction. Kind of like what I've alluded to previously in that we have to make sense out of the independent variables that are impacting the dependent variables. Um, regression is best used when the independent variable is strongly correlated with the de dependent variable, but uncorrelated with the other independent variables. So we want, we need the correlation, we need the dependent variable to move when the independent variable is manipulated. Okay, we have to have that correlation so that there's a relationship there and a strong correlation is the best. We don't want our independent variables to be correlated with each other. Okay, we, because that's going to skew our results because all of a sudden correlations are going to get all mixed up in there. So we want independent variables being independent of each other, but each of those correlated with our dependent variable. And then the general goal of the regression is to identify the fewest independent variables necessary to predict the dependent variable. And again, this goes back to we can dump all independent variables that we can possibly think of in there, and we're going to get 100%, and we're going to be able to say we can explain all the variance. But that's not what we want. We want the fewest that makes the largest impact on the variance in our dependent variable. That's what we're looking for. So when we go back and we look at the different types of regression, it could be that hierarchical or stepwise regression is a better method to analyze your data than just the multiple linear regression where you put everything in. So some of those practical issues we have to look at are ratio of cases to independent variables, absence of outliers among the independent variables and the dependent variables, absence of multicollinearity and singularity, the normality, linearity, homoscedasticity of residuals, the independence of errors, and the absence of outliers in the, in the solution. And again, this comes into cleaning up your data, knowing your data, knowing if, it, if you need to make changes, if there's any type of statistical adjustments that have to be there. So this comes with practice. And uh, for me, until I actually had to go through each one of these and clean up some data, it kind of was very abstract to me. But these are things you have to consider when you're actually running some form of multiple regression. Again, the ratio of cases to independent variables, you have to consider that because you don't want to have all the, um, you want to have the real world in terms of what independent variables are going to predict the variance. So with more independent variables than cases, then you can find a regression solution that completely predicts your dependent variable. And again, that, that, that's going to be suspect. That's not what we're really finding in the real world here. So there's a required sample size and it's going to depend upon your desired power, the alpha level, the number of predictors, the, the expected effect size. All of this goes back into when you're designing your study. So you're going to determine what your sample size is going to need. I've included here a couple of rule of thumbs. There's actually in SPS some ways that you can run statistical power analysis to get your sample size. Rule of thumb um, is what I've used. I've not gone into the real um, statistical power analysis just because the rule of thumb typically works for what I do in behavioral research. But a rule of thumb is your sample size N should be greater than or equal to 80 plus 8M where M is your independent variables, okay? For testing the multiple correlation, and then your N needs to be greater than 104 plus M for testing individual predictors. 
when you're figuring this up, determine, use that larger rule of thumb so that you get a larger sample size um, because you're probably going to be looking at individual predictors and not just the correlation there. So um, an example over here is if you have six predictors, which are independent variables, you would need 50 plus 8 times 6, okay? So you're going to equal 98 cases to test regression and 104 plus 6, which would equal 110 cases for testing individual predictors. Um, again, if you're interested in calculating both, go with the higher one. The higher cases to ind independent variable ratio is needed when dependent variables are going to be skewed or if, you want a if you're looking at a small effect size because you need more cases to capture a small effect size versus a large effect size, or if there's um, going to be substantial measurement era, error in, from less reliable variables. Again, those go back into designing the study and taking those things into consideration. But it's important to have this done up front so that when you do get your data, you don't run into these type of problems and all of a sudden you don't have enough or a large enough sample to come out with valid findings. And again, we've talked a little bit about outliers and you need to make sure that you have an absence of outliers among both your independent variables and your dependent variables because again, those extreme cases can skew your data one way or the other. So you're going to have to determine what to do with those when you're cleaning up your data. Um, is there some statistical alteration of the data that you can do or do you have to eliminate those? You have to make those decisions. Um, but you look at your outliers before you run your regression so that you can make decisions about those. If you run regression and then you look at your outliers, you can tend to be mm, prodded to make decisions about what to do with those outliers based on how you want your regression analysis to come out. So, you know, to be totally objective, this is part of the cleaning up the data before you actually start running your analysis. You have to have the absence of multicollinearity and singularity because either of these problems, um, if the independent variables are highly correlated um, or those interactions are there, um, it's going to impact your final analysis. So you have to make sure you don't have the multicollinearity or singularity among those independent variables. Normality, linearity, homoscedasticity of residuals. And again, you're going to look at your residual scatter plots. This is where you use the scatter plots in terms of looking to see how your cases fall around the, the center or around the norms to determine if you've got problems here. So the assumptions of analysis is residuals are normally distributed around the predicted dependent variables. Residuals have a horizontal line relationship with, with, the, with predicted dependent variable scores. So you're going to see that in your scatter plot. And the variance of residuals about predicted dependent variable scores is the same for all predicted scores. This right here sounds a little confusing right now. I know it does. But I will bring in some of these examples for you and we'll work through some of these so you understand how to run them and how to look at them and how to make those decisions. I just want you to be exposed to this right now and know that this is part of cleaning up your data when you do multiple regression or you plan on doing multiple regression. The independence of errors, again, the, the assumption here is that, <clears throat> and it's testable through uh, residual analysis, but that there's going to be independence. If there's non-independence of the errors, the residuals, that's going to impact, again, your outcomes, your results. And examples of this could be um, distance or time impact that. And so an example of non-independence based on time could be that maybe you're interviewing um, individuals, you're completing a face-to-face -face interview, and the interviewer is not as skilled when they first begin that interviewing process. And there's a considerable amount of time from the first individual who was actually interviewed and the last individual who was actually interviewed. So there's a, that intervening variable there in terms of where it's the interviewer's skill based on time that actually is going to create a non-independence of the errors. 
And then distance can also do it. There's, there can actually be a geographical distance sometimes that does, um, it creates this. This is just two examples. So if you're interviewing individuals um, regarding exposure to a toxic source, and some are farther away from the toxic source than others are, then this is a natural variable reaction in there in terms of their responses. What you have to determine is if you have non-independence, is it just a nuisance factor that you're actually going to have to eliminate or explain, do something about, or is it contributing to your research? Is it valuable in your research? So independence of errors is another thing that we look at when we're running multiple regression. And finally, outliers in the solution. Um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes cases are going to fit poorly into that regression equation. <clears throat> so when you put the line on there and you have the visual, the scatter plot, and you have the regression equation line, but you have some of those outliers that are out there because they just don't fit on that. Um, so cases with those large residuals are outliers. You have to identify those and you have to make decisions again about what to do with them. You don't want outliers in your independent and dependent variables and you don't want outliers in your solution either because it skews your results. These formulas use the mean um, in the formula. So anytime you have outliers or you have numbers that are very high, very low, it's going to skew that mean and it's going to skew your results. So these are some practical issues that you have to go through, think about, address. You can't ignore them. You're either going to have to explain them. You're going to have to say it's there, so therefore it weakens my results. You're going to have to do something about them. But you're going to have to know if they exist or not whenever you're actually utilizing some form of multiple regression to understand your results and know how valid your results are.